the Liberals say they have a balanced and realistic approach for Ontario. Let's discuss. We welcome Sean Conway, former Liberal Cabinet Minister. Janet Ecker, former Progressive Conservative Cabinet Minister. Dave Cook, former NDP Cabinet Minister. Michael Luba, Green Party campaigner. And Genevieve Tomney, Queen's Park reporter for CBC Toronto. And Michael and Genevieve, don't take this the wrong way. But can I welcome especially <laughs> you three back to these parts because you three were together on our old program, Fourth Reading, for so many years. So it's nice to see three former education ministers together around the table again. Yeah. Michael wasn't even in public school. When we <laughs> Michael, <laughs> might, even, not, Michael might not have been born when you guys were doing yeah. that. <laughs> anyway, okay, Janet, let's get into this. First question that I asked the Premier, I want to ask you as well. This election, is it a rendering of a verdict on the Wynn government or the last 11 years of Liberals? Well, and I think that's the critical issue right now is what is the ballot question. And I think if the ballot question is time for change, we've had enough. And I think there certainly are a number of voters who are on that, uh, in, in that camp. Then yes, I think the Premier has, it doesn't matter whether she's only been there as Premier for 16 months or not, they want that change. But if it is, you know, it's a ballot question where people are saying, you know, who do they like? You know, that might be a little more challenging for, uh, for Tim. It might give Andrea a little bit of an edge. But on the other hand, I think if people are looking for someone who says, yes, there are really serious problems that the, pro you know, the province has to solve, uh, the deficit being one of them, um, you know, they've got a clear choice with Tim and what he's putting forward. Dave, which is it? Well, I think the ballot question is turning out to be a, a ballot question on Tim Hudak's budget plans, not, not on the government. So I think... Uh, I think she's, uh, he's, he's conveniently, and this will be the third election in a row, perhaps, that the Tories have been able to switch the ballot question to what they're presenting, and the folks don't like it. So uh, I think, I, I think uh, Kathleen ha Wynne has done a pretty effective job at turning it around, and there hasn't been the kind of microscope on her plan to see whether it is workable. Michael? If this was about Kathleen Wynne, I think she'd be coasting right now because personally I like her, her personal brand appeals to me, but uh, I guess what I'm seeing from the electorate is a bit of hesitancy and I think I see that because she's attached to a big machine, a machine that as she's noted before to sort of get herself out of some difficult positions, it has a lot of heads, right? She's just one. So she may be very likable, but the Liberal Party to the electorate seems right now to be a bit of a hydra and uh, she's got to distance herself from that. Genevieve, as you talk to liberal people, what's their hope on this? Well, you know, from, from being on the campaign trail, you really get the sense that the tone of the campaigning is about looking forward. What are the plans to create jobs? What's the plan for the economy? And, you know, up until debate night, we weren't really hearing a whole lot, you know, about the liberal record, about the gas plants, but that really came up as a huge theme uh, on debate night. And since then, we've seen some other things rearing their heads again. Uh, Orange has come up in the news. So I think that now we're sort of seeing, a, I guess, a bit of a, a two-pronged approach because it is still, you know, focused on the, on the jobs and the economy and the plan going forward. But we are sort of seeing more and more as we barrel towards the finish line about, about the record, too. So I think in these final days... That's going to be a huge theme. Sean, clearly parties pick new leaders in an effort to change the channel from the things they didn't like about the previous leader. How well do you think this leader and this team has done at that? Well, I think uh, parties change leaders often at the 10-year mark in Ontario because they realize that renewal is important. It's very difficult. The longer a party's in office, the more decisions they make that are not popular, the more uh, experiences they have that might not be as ideal. Uh, so I think the Liberals here have done what a very successful Conservative Party did when they changed uh, George Drew for Leslie Frost, when they changed Mr. Uh, Frost for Mr. Robarts, Mr. Davis for Mr. Robarts. Uh, so uh, that, there's a long tradition of that in Ontario. In my experience, uh, elections generally are about the future. Which of the various teams has the best plan uh, for the next four or five years? Yes, they all carry baggage of a sort. The government party will always carry a little bit more. But generally speaking, my experience in Ontario is which of these teams has the best plan for the next few years? And I think in that space, I think uh, Kathleen Wynne is reasonably well positioned. I want to pick up on two words you said, which are they change leaders to deal with things that are quote unquote not ideal. Tell me if this fits into that category. We found out late this afternoon that apparently detectives served a court order to staffers at Queen's Park for key records and they confirmed that they have interviewed former Premier Dalton McGuinty about the gas plant scandal. 
Does that come under the category of not ideal? Uh, yes, with a capital N and a capital I. I think uh, Premier Wynn, I, th I mean, there were days where I think, the, the, you know, she th anytime she opened a, ca a cupboard door, another skeleton fell out. Um, it is amazing that the party is still standing uh, when you look at that series of things that have occurred. So I why mean, is it still standing? Well, but can I just make a yeah. point here? In, at a critical point in the latter third of the national election campaign in 2006, the national police force made a big splash uh, against a minister in the uh, Martin government, uh, Ralph Goodale, on the income trust matter. Mm -hmm. And we all know what that came to after the election was over. It so, came to nothing after the election was well, over. Well, my point but it is. It might have cost Martin but the election. I must say, well, it may have certainly, it didn't help, but my point is that uh, I don't find a great deal of news in that story because I are heard you, last are you week. Are saying liberals keep getting investigated no, by police? No, but I, listen, I do point out that uh, this, this story is not entirely new. I read last week that uh, this process was ongoing. But I do point out that in 2006, late December 2006, uh, the RCMP, in a pretty bold move, uh, laid some... Okay, you finish your point, yeah. then Dave. Yeah, but I think I think uh, what's interesting here. I mean, you have someone uh, who you know the p voters do sort of like her as a person, but she's carrying around the more baggage than most politicians have to ever carry. Um, yeah, whether it's e-health, whether it's orange, whether it's it's gas plants, whether it's I mean, there's just the list is very very long. And and now Mars, and now this latest investigation. But, so I we're not agree. talking about one incident, Sean. I would agree with you that there's a lot of baggage, and and that does make you kind of scratch your head and say. Why is she still in the game? Normally, uh, because I still believe that people, voters don't always look forward. They also look backward. Mm -hmm. And they want to, if they don't like a government, they want to throw the bums out. And under any other normal circumstances, you would think that would be the case. So why haven't but, they here? Well, well because it's, I, it's think a, that, it's I just different... don't think that Tim Hudak's approach, not just in this uh, election campaign, but all the kind of policies that he spelled out as possibilities over the last couple of years have really put a label on him as being wanting to de uh, declare war on unions and to be very negative and lots of cuts that people can't handle. Michael and Genevieve. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail right on the head. This, if, if this was about, um, I guess, the, the traditional sort of scandal, I think we'd see it, it, it be gone, right? Kathleen would be out, the Liberals would be out. But when you look at the alternatives that people have, and when I watch that debate, uh, you know, a few nights ago there. I mean, I'm agreeing. I think we do have an alternative, but most people aren't aware of that, and I really don't think they know where to go, right? I don't think they do, and I think she's the safest bet. How do you account for the fact, Genevieve, that this party, with all of its barnacles, is still, in most public opinion surveys, in first place? Well, you know, <laughs> she gets a lot of guff for it, but the fact that she came out and, and faced it head on, said, you know, I knew I was going to be carrying this baggage, and has come out many times and, and apologized and said I'm sorry and said we made wrong decisions and then talked about how she plans to move forward, you know, she, she has been getting, you know, some, some guff for it, but I think that in a way it does help people move on as well. Strategically too, I mean, when, the conf, the, the, when you compare her with McGinty, um, McGinty was an incrementalist, he was more on the conservative side of the Liberal Party, she's been on the left side, I mean, Let's face it, her platform in many ways is the most left-wing platform uh, out there right now. More than uh, the NDP. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think if, if you were designing how you were going to contrast to a government uh, under a premier who had lost a lot of uh, uh, support, she's they've done it yeah, pretty well. well. And they, 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 David they, makes a very good yeah. point here because we know traditionally in Ontario, the majority is someplace in the middle, sometimes moderate right, sometimes moderate left, either a progressive conservative or a conservative liberal. I think Kathleen Wynne, of the various major parties, has crafted a platform which uh, I think speaks to that potential majority on which most governments in Ontario have depended for election. You don't now, worry as a rural liberal that her, par that oh, her platform there, is a little too No, the there's no question that, the, uh, that uh, my cousin, John Yakubuski, is doing very well in my old constituency. But the reality is, the, uh, if you can count numbers, uh, the election is going to be decided in 
urban and suburban uh, uh, Ontario. And the next election, even more so, with a very different kind of election map. And so she's also trying to pitch at liberals and progressives. So her platform, as you nicely canvassed with her a few moments ago, talks to young people. It talks to, it talks to women. It talks to older people about their but I also retirement. Think that if, also if there had been so. more scrutiny of the platform, if there had been more scrutiny of the platform, if the other dynamic hadn't happened with, with uh, Mr. Hudak's extreme right, I think people would start asking the Premier, do you say no to anything? I, I was talking earlier, there was this thing a couple of days before the writs were dropped, if we're allowed to say the writs are dropped. Drawn up. Uh, I know, I heard that. But uh, where Glenn Murray went into London and announced that there was going to be high-speed rail going from London to Kitchener to Toronto. And this was going to happen with 28 trips a day, and it was, you know, I mean, this came out of the blue. Now, we down in Windsor, we were kind of worried about that because that would really isolate Windsor. So the mayor got on the phone to the premier, and the premier said, oh, no, Windsor's in, too. So you've got to start asking yourself some questions. Is she going to be capable, if she gets a majority, of saying no, because there are fiscal problems here? But her plan, at least, has been uh, fully costed. Oh, it has been. John, well, it's wait been, a minute. Wait a minute. She no, said no, just a no, second. No, no, no. John, she whoa, whoa, whoa. let's give Janet a chance. John, let's give Janet a chance. John, John, John <laughs> she said that she was going to reintroduce her budget on what, 20 days after the mm -hmm. election. A high-speed rail, 28 times a day. Trust me, was to London and Windsor was not in that plan. And we're not talking about pocket change that she's going no, to find her, underneath the cushions in no, the but couch. Her plan is her it plan. is a major. And it is a major to Dave cost. Point, and I hang on a second. Problem, one time. Sean, I think the problem is is that while people can look at her as a very likable person, I mean, my organization has dealt with her, and, and she's she's been wonderful. You know, the Toronto financial yeah, the financial services, services, services in terms of a number of things, but also too. I mean, my members are saying. Okay, but what are you going to do about the tough economic choices that have to be made in this province? And you can argue about whether Tim's doing it the right way or the wrong way, but I think from Tim's perspective, he feels really strongly that he knows there's going to have to be serious choices made, and then he feels that it's the right thing to do to lay it out to people and say, I have to make some of those choices if you Genevieve. elect me. You guys are the same. You have, <laughs> you're just all, all a bunch of air hogs all the time now. Nothing's oh, changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Was it a mistake for the NDP to basically come out the day after the budget went in and say we're not going to support this budget because that's the liberal plan and as a result there has been no scrutiny of this liberal I shouldn't say no but little scrutiny of the liberal plan and as Dave points out a lot of scrutiny of the Tory plan because everything happened very quickly after that. Once Andrea came out, we were basically into a campaign period, even before the writs were drawn up. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting is, yes, there's been a lot of attention uh, paid to Tim's plan because he has been so explicit about what he plans to do. But we did sort of an interesting thing and had the same economist who was taking apart Tim's plan look at the NDP plan and the Liberal plan as well and, you know, found holes there too because there is the big question of, what are you going to do after the spending this year? How are you going to get that budget to balance as they're promising to do with a budget that's going, or a deficit that's going to increase over the next couple of years? I mean, economists are looking at those numbers and saying there's going to have to be a squeeze there. Where's it going to come from? Let me from? ask the former finance yeah. minister. Can you cut spending 800 million bucks year over year, as the Liberals are planning to do, without cutting services or laying people off? Because the Premier just told us 20 minutes ago she can. Well, it, first of all, it isn't one of the false dynamics about this is you either spend gazillions or you're slashing and burning services to people. And that's not the dynamic. There are lots of ways you can do things differently. You can have alternative service delivery. You can have attrition here, but you might hire there. There's a lot of choices that you can make. So it's not a question of slash and burn. And with all due respect, you know, Tim Hudak's not talking about slashing and burning. He is talking about moving the budget to balance. And so, yes, there's going to be some difficult choices in that. But if you're looking at your own household budget, uh, you're running a small business, I mean, those are choices you make every day of the week. And I think one of the things a lot of people out there, they may like some of the things they see in her budget, because we all like to have more things. And there's some wonderful things there that, that, that are very attractive to people. But at the same time, you have to also make sure that you're being clear that if you're going to reduce 6%, in a ministry, in and it's interesting, in a non-priority ministry, that means job loss. I mean, I'm on the board of a hospital. Um, we have actually had, over the last couple of years, have had to lay off uh, uh, positions. Now, most of it we were able to do 
with attrition, but that, it, you know, by the liberal definition right now, that would be job loss. But, Steve, but that's something that had to do to balance Steve, our budget. I thought you picked it up nicely with Kathleen in the interview. There's more than one kind of a deficit. I mean, the middle class in Ontario and in Canada generally is feeling very put upon. There's a sense that uh, fairness is not quite as evident as it was 20, 30 years ago, and a lot of middle class families are feeling the pressure of educating their kids, making sure their kids have some opportunity upon their graduation. There's a concern about pension income for older people. If you live in most of southern Ontario, you know there is a gigantic problem with transit, both urban and suburban transit and other kinds of transit. And you can either decide when interest rates are very low to invest in these kinds of badly needed productivity no, enhancements. That. Well, but you've got that's to spend Sean, some money that's on not the if you're not prepared Sean, to do it. No, the point now, is, and Sean. the problem for the, the conservatives is they have made economic uh, credibility their cornerstone, and the fundamentals of their plan are at best social credit. And as far as I can tell, only Homer Simpson would okay. volunteer to be Sean, Minister of right Finance now, under this scheme. Right now, this government, the third biggest ministry in this government right now is called debt. Interest and, on the debt. And interest on the debt. Well, and, and sorry, but but it's fine. No, well, no. It, I mean, we're well, not frankly, in a, we're not well, in a debt crisis. Well, give us time. I mean, because the concern you've got, like, if those interest rates start to go back up. I mean, this is a very, very unusual period yeah. that we are all in, and and you're and people are saying, oh well, gee, it's okay now because the rates are so low. But you need to start making some progress. Okay, and even Dwight Duncan, to, even Dwight Duncan, the former Liberal finance minister, has been out there publicly saying, like, to his government, like, guys, come on, we got to have some control. Let here. Let me go to Dave on this because again, you've run a minister, you're education minister, you were Comstock minister. No. What else? Um, I was uh, housing and municipal affairs. Okay, could you take a 6% cut to the budget of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing without laying people off? Well, I mean, housing, we were building housing, so it would have meant less. How I, I can look at education. 6% of education would be big bucks. Would be very hard to do. There'd be ma there'd have to be uh, there'd have to be major layoffs. I, I, I remember when we had the, we looked at like a two hundred and fifty million dollar expenditure control program. I mean, it took us a, a weeks in order to try that to try to find that kind of money. So it's it's not easy, and I think that's one of the concerns that. Uh, uh, Andrew Horvath has had that saying that, you know, it's nice to have this, I mean, I love the pension proposal. It's something my dad fought for years ago. Um, it, I, I like the, the transit uh, uh, proposals and transportation. I guess the question is, are we going to actually see it? Is it real enough that can actually happen when you take a look at the fiscal situation? Genevieve, when you're out there on the hustings, because the HUDAC proposal to eliminate 100,000 positions over four years has really sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room, has the Liberal plan in their very budget to cut spending by $800 million not receive the kind of scrutiny that maybe it should have. I think you're absolutely right. I think that the focus has been on that. And the other thing that the, the Liberal platform has allowed them to do that I've noticed is travel around to different ridings in the province and offer goodies wherever they go. If they're in Thunder Bay, there's a billion dollars for the Ring of Fire. If they're in Kitchener, there's high-speed rail. So, you know, because there are all of these spending promises in their platform, they're able to focus on that. And really what the Liberals are banking on with this is that people are going to be so jazzed about those goodies that they could be getting that they're not going to worry so much about what the deficit is because that's such a big number that it's almost hard to imagine and wrap Michael. your head around. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the absolute necessity of the matter is that these, pro these promises aren't promises that are meant to be kept necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. They're about distancing the party and the leader from the party as it was and the leader as it was, creating a new image, right? Building that up, getting voters to forget about the past and to move on. It's a political game, right? In the end of the game, I don't know what it's going to be. It might be really bad for Ontarians. But it yeah. might be really good well, for the Liberal Party. The other thing about the, I think where, where Tim Hudak uh, made a tactical mistake is that 100,000 jobs, people can understand that. There's 107 ridings in the province, so that roughly is 940 jobs per riding. I can tell you if I were a candidate in this election and I were not with the Conservative team, I would be going to every meeting saying, 
which 940 people in the riding of North Renfrew are going to get a pink slip over the next four years? Well, just over years, 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 into order. We were doing in that first year 5%. Now 5% is supposed to be draconian, slash and burn, and we protected health and education and classroom funding within education. So if that's slash and burn, what's 6%? But you were doing tax cutting at the same time. No, the, yes, they, you so were. We, but we, had, were, to, we the, had to take out. We had to the take common out. sense revolution, and people like Ralph Klein said it was very dangerous. You were well, not. Don't forget you, the one big thing. I mean, a 20% cut in welfare. 22. 22. Well, I mean, that, that was huge. All right. But the that ministries, no, but just a second. Well, hold on. Because a lot of those, it was 5%, uh, there was a lot of 5% across the board on that. So if 5% was draconian and terrible, what's, what's six? six? Michael. So I, again, I think the thing we need to establish here is that it's the same sort of game we're playing as with the Liberals, right? 100,000 jobs being, uh, being cut. Why? Because it's a nice number and it's an order of magnitude smaller than the million jobs he's going to create. He has no work. intention of creating a million jobs. He doesn't even but, but have an concern, established figure for that. But the point I want to make, and I agree with Janet, th this is not going to be easy. The winner here has got a tough job. Let me be clear about that. Absolutely. But there is a very real sensitivity and a real concern about jobs. Oh, and the, in this Absolutely. environment, I think it's a very dangerous thing. I think you want to be more about the sunrise than the sunset. You want to be, and I think yes. that in liberals, you know, it is about, as Wilfrid Laurier said, you know, it is about hope and opportunity, and uh, you would expect the Conservative Party to be focused on, you know, on deficits and uh, and on tax cutting. That's that's their stock and trade. Except you would expect the Conservatives to be right on their numbers, and they made serious miscalculations. Sean, you know, Sean, if you go back to to the early 1990s when Bob Ray got to be, you know, the Premier and his government came in just in time for the early 90s recession, which was pretty yeah. brutal in its own right. And in that first year, Floyd stood up and said. We're choosing to Floyd Lochran, excuse me. Finance. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, stood up and said a very deliberate. You know, we're choosing investing in people over worrying about the deficit. And by the end of their mandate, they were doing social contract, which I still think was a legitimate way to sort of try and resolve some of the issues they were facing. But there is quote a the lot socialist less government proposal than what Mr. McGinty did. But that uh, well, yeah, but, but at history. least so, yes. so there's you know so and 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 with good intentions, I'm sure, when they stood up and made that statement. So here we are today hearing Minister Sousa saying that they want to choose, you know, yeah, deficit's important, but if they have to invest in people versus deficit. And this economic cycle you know, is going looking, to if end. If you look at the politics of it, again, if, if uh, Wynn had decided to go a little more on the conservative side and, and balancing, moving really towards balancing a budget, that would have left a huge opening for the NDP. And what she's been able to do. I mean, in some ways it's brilliant. I just don't see how the next four years is going to work out and at the end of the four years that there's, uh, that there's not going to be like blood on the floor. And in southwestern Ontario, <laughs> Dave Cook's territory, I got to tell you, you looked at that Globe and Mail Saturday piece of a week ago, uh, it is very, very tough for a lot of those people. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you, if you are the leader of the government, especially if you're the leader of the Liberal Party, you don't want to look and sound like an 18th century doctor whose first and last impulse is to bleed the patient. Hmm. Let me put a new issue no, on the table here. It's the taxpayers who well, are bleeding very badly, Sean. Also looking Sorry, for and hoping yeah. to keep a job. <laughs> okay, putting a new issue on the table here. The Ontario Provincial Police Association has done something quite extraordinary, which is to take out some pretty tough ads. They say, Genevieve not endorsing the Liberals, but certainly against Tim Hudak and the Conservatives. What's been the blowback on that? Well, you know, not not endorsing the Liberals, not endorsing the NDP, but basically going anti-conservative. And, you know, it's it's been all over the place. Basically what it's amounted to is a lot of emails in my inbox from all of the parties going back and forth at each other saying, well, the OPPA supported you then, and then they supported you then, and, you know, who's right and who's wrong. But I think the bottom line is, you know, there there I think there is a legitimate concern in terms of running ads during an election campaign i think that if you're the cops if you're the if you're the well, cops it's the, the, the police association the political it's rights because before there was actually legislation that prevented this hmm. and i'm trying i was trying to remember when i heard this issue today which party which government actually gave well, them one and did was wrong 
Well, like, yeah, I, I know, but it'd be interesting because I thought it was, about, I thought it might it was you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I don't think. <laughs> was, it, yeah. 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 was it you guys? <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> but as I said, if we did, we yes. shouldn't have. Anyway, Mike, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. I was saying we're revisiting history. It's a dangerous game. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, these are, the, these are the people with guns, right? And their job yeah. is to serve uh, the government of the day in terms of, you know, setting the policy, whoever that government is. And I think whether they were endorsing us, and there's no question that... that they endorsed it, you it, in 1995. Yes, they certainly did. You go and, admit it was it was very well for me anyway it was very yeah. ple funny to yeah. watch this today to see Hudak uh, attacking the police union when yeah. most of the time I mean they're arm in arm and uh, so it was but, kind of but you know isn't an endorsement uh, different than well, an ad I, I don't know I mean if union. you're if an, an attack ad versus an endorsement they're two different things they're, they're, yes they're, yes they are I would uh, yeah there are but I th but I think it's it's difficult to, to, to splice it yeah. you either you're you're either halfway pregnant or you're yeah. not but Sean given the cynicism in politics analogy. today <laughs> it's going to be I suspect it's going to be hard for people not to think that there wasn't some quid pro quo here. Police, you take on Tim Hudak and you chip away at him, and somewhere down the road, we're gonna make good on that. Well, as a former education on? minister who still bears the lacerations from the 1990 campaign from my good friends in the teacher federations, uh, I. Um, what what what, never what, been their strong well, point, as what, we what all can know. I say? I mean, as there's uh, the the, uh, the the special interest uh, uh, campaigning uh, is becoming uh, more, not less, a feature of provincial and national yeah. politics yeah. in Canada, very much like it is in the United States. And um, you know, I, in a perfect world, you'd like to think it would remain for the parties to do their own advocacy, but apparently we have uh, moved beyond it's that. A lot this time. Teachers yeah. federations are doing a lot, and then this and, other and group, and now the. And Police. it's damaging. It's damaging the political thing because, again, you know, as Sean loves to tell us, if you look at democracies over the years, being able to broker uh, uh, solutions to problems, bring together interest groups and whatever to come up with solutions, is one of the ways that societies, de democratic societies, function. And I think what we're seeing, you know, in all parties and with the interest groups, it's just more splintering. Well, all I want Nobody, is we yeah. should put some money on the table that if Kathleen Wynne gets reelected and they have to bring in restraint. How far into the mandate will it be before the teachers' unions are putting ads out against well, the government? Look, look what happened to Dalton McGuinty. I mean, the Premier McGuinty said, I'm the education minister. He invested literally billions of dollars in the education system. And when he said, we're running into economic trouble, I want some restraint. And let's be clear, what was the restraint he was asking? Like, hold the line. He wasn't taking away benefits. He wasn't adding in workload. Or to impose a freeze. Yeah. Salary and freeze. And what thanks, with all due respect, did he get from the teacher unions? Janet and Dave are making a really good point, Stephen. All I'd add to it is this. That, that the politics that we grew up in and were nurtured in was a politics where the middle class uh, was the dominant uh, uh, player in the, uh, the equation and, uh, you know, and particularly for liberal parties, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. A tide that is static and God forbid that it should start to ebb is going to lead to a very different kind of politics and what I'm concerned about in the general debate nationally and you see it in the United States even more starkly is that as the as that sense of of a, of a fair and balanced equation with a strong middle starts to get replaced by a um, a, a skewing of the the national wealth well, or the provincial wealth and you get a polarization let me pick up on that because about two and a half minutes to go here Dave Cook I want to start with you because you sat in a minority parliament for some of your political career it's possible Ontarians on the 12th of June are going to elect another minority parliament. These people are supposed to, they don't have to like each other, but they got to get along well enough to do the public's business. How does that happen when one leader is suing another leader for slander, when the third leader, Andrew Horvath, is saying that the Liberal Party is corrupt and Kathleen Wynne, you're at the center of it? How do you do business under those circumstances? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's going to be a matter of survival because the reality is they're going to have to. Um, they're going to absolutely have to, and we'll see what the numbers are. I mean, there will be some realities. If Tim Hudak wins both a number of seats and the popular vote, and that it's still a minority, he, in my view, there's no question he gets to be the premier. He gets to be the premier, yeah. and, but how does he win a vote? Uh, then, I mean, he's going to have to put, a, uh, put something together and try to get it through. If he can't, then I guess we'll be back at the polls fairly quickly or, or well, something else will happen. He's not going to have any money. Uh, <laughs> I think it could make for some very interesting times sure. in provincial politics because, you know, the C word, coalition, has become a bad word on the campaign well, in the last few days. We've never had a coalition. Despite I mean, the fact almost every other British parliamentary system yeah seems to do but, it. But, and but it's a swear word here. Hang system. on, Genevieve wanted to finish well, your point. Well, I was just going to say, it, it could be very interesting to watch the dynamic between the New Democrats 
and the progressive conservatives if a, if a Tim Hudak minority is elected. But the New Democrats, I mean, if in fact there were another quick election, the NDP would be in deep, deep trouble. Of course. So, and I mean, there's gonna, people are going to have to make it work yeah. somehow. And get it straight. <laughs> Parliament, uh, parliamentary right. governments operate. You don't need a coalition. Mr. Davis didn't have a coalition in 1975. And maybe more interestingly, in 1943, when the Tory dynasty began, George Drew, Colonel George Drew, had, a ha had about four more seats than the CCF. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Liberals who'd been in government for eight or nine years ended in a distant third place. And guess what? George Drew and Ted Jolliffe made the thing work for two, two and a half years. Interestingly, because Mr. Drew was pretty darn progressive. He was a lot more progressive uh, in that government than he had been in the late 1930s. So let's, Davis... Let's, let's let the guy running for office have the last word. <laughs> no, no, no. He's not running. He's just campaigning. He's not running. But go ahead, Michael. Talking for other people, not for myself. I mean, this has been a lovely conversation. Seriously, it has. Thank you, Michael. But we've, we've been talking about games, right? We've been talking about politics like it's a game, like, uh, you know, seats are some sort of chess piece when a lot's on the line. And I just want to impress that and maybe some people uh, back home are noticing this whole election has been about games. This whole campaign has been a big game. I want people to know that there's another option that's not right. really playing the game. Is the moderator game? allowed right. to disagree with one of the guests? I, I don't think we've been treating it as a game at all. I'm dead. The last question that I've put on the table well, is, I, I it's not a heard... game. How are they going to get along? Because sure. they have to get along to do the public's business. Right, right. I, I guess I'm referring to more of the talk about uh, you know, who's saying what and what they're thinking when they're saying it, as opposed to, I guess, hardcore discussion of the issues, evaluating the liberal platform, which is something that you yourself said we haven't really done properly. And I don't think that we necessarily did properly the, today. The last 30 end, seconds. Right? At the end of the day, uh, and uh, Dave and Janet and I have been there, and I remember 1985. I remember, for example, uh, a famous policy that all three parties agreed in general. And when they actually, here's what it looks like. Well, not so fast. The, the, the business of government is the business of making choices. And often, mm -hmm difficult choices Absolutely. and assigning, you know, uh, costs and benefits. And so I have no doubt, I think Dave Cook and Janet are, as usual, very correct in their observation here that these are mature men and women and they will be elected. This will be the second election in two and a half years. Sean, and they will have to hook. make this parliament work. We've got to go. We've made this panel work. Thanks, everybody, for coming in tonight. Great seeing you fourth reading people again. And for our other two guests, thanks as well. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.